Fathers and daughters, it's complicated. It's complicated under any circumstances, but when your father is Orson Welles, well, your life is a who's who, aware in the world, and a world of wonder. Our special guest today has written an intimate and beautiful memoir, In My Father's Shadow, A Daughter Remembers Orson Welles, and we are very pleased that she's here tonight to talk to us about the book. She, also known as Orson's Kid, writes candidly and revealingly about her life with and without her father. Sometimes there would be years and continents between their visits. Still, as she puts it, he lit a thousand fires in her mind. There has been sadness, pain, joy, disappointment, discovery, euphoria, hope, humor, and tenderness, and always the laugh, the booming baritone of Orson Welles. Her memoir includes some never-before-seen family photographs as well. It's such a well-written book, which brings me to the fact that I really do need to mention that she is not a first-time author. She's an educational expert, and the body of her work may be familiar to many of you in this room. Today, she is one of the writers of the number one educational bestseller, Brain Quest. I know they were extremely popular with my kids when they were growing up. And I just thought, with the holiday season ahead of us, that I would just pass along the information that they are the best stocking stuffers. <laughs> we have something in common, Chris and I. Our fathers named us. In my case, to deflect any tug or expectation to name me after her mother, Matilda, Mom left it up to my father. He liked the sound of Barbara Ann Danis. Orson Welles also liked the sound of the name he chose for his daughter, Christopher Welles. Hmm. By way of introduction, I will steal verbatim the wording from the telegram sent by Orson Welles when our guest today was born. Christopher, she is here. Hmm. Please help me welcome Chris Wells Baker. Thank you, Barbara. That was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara, for that lovely, lovely introduction. Um, I've been doing a lot of interviews lately, and uh, my favorite question, or rather statement, that an interviewer made to me was, um, before I read your book, I had this picture of your father as being this, this monumental movie icon, and I thought, how scary he must be in person that it, that it would be intimidating to meet him and I'd also heard stories about how difficult he was and how temperamental he could be and then I read your book and I discovered a completely different Orson Welles and I discovered to my astonishment that he had a good sense of humor he was a kind man and that he was really a lot of fun to be with so I was very pleased by this comment because the main reason I wrote this book was to give Orson Welles a human face and to share with you an intimate, candid picture of who he really was in person. Not the person that you may have heard about, not the person that you may have read about in all the many, many books out there about him because as many of you may know, there are many biographies of my father out there. There are many books of his critical films and other works. But none of these books really capture the Orson Welles that I knew from my earliest childhood in Hollywood until the day he died in 1985. And so I felt I needed to put out there an intimate, candid portrait of my father as he really was. I wanted this to be part of the vast Wellesian bibliography. Also, another problem that I have with many of the books that have been already written about him is that they were written by people who never met him. Or maybe the closest they got to him was a long-distance phone call. So many of these books 
are written on speculation or second, third, fourth hand information and consequently there are many misperceptions about my father which I truly hope that my book will correct. And finally, there are a number of people in my father's life who are glossed over in the other books about him. And I felt these people needed their due. They needed to be fully known to the public. Beginning with my mother, the first Mrs. Orson Welles, she's dismissed in most of the books as a Chicago socialite. And that's really all you ever hear about her. Well, it's true that my mother was born in Chicago, but she was not a socialite. And I think in my book, you will finally meet her and have a much better understanding of who she really was. Other people that I give a lot of space to are the people who really became like my father's foster parents. Roger Hill, we called him Skipper, and his wife Hortense. They ran a school for boys in Woodstock, Illinois that my father attended when he was very young. And my father was orphaned when he was quite young. His own mother died when he was nine. His father died when he was about 15. And so the Hills became like his substitute family and he was close to them all his life. And also they became my honorary grandparents so I was also very close to them. And in fact, I even went to Todd School for Boys. I was the only girl in a boys' school <laughs> for about a year. Um, and the main reason I went there was because of the hills, because actually um, I lived on their farm while I was a, a student at Todd, and I only had to cope with all the little boys during the day. At the end of the day, I got to go back to the farm and be with Granny and Skipper, as I called them. But anyway, you'll get to know them very well in my book. And finally, the woman who was probably the most important woman in my father's life was a Croatian sculptor by the name of Oya Kodar. You won't read much about her in the other books, but in my book, you, she gets a whole chapter because she really was very important to my father. She shared the last 20 years of his life with him when my father was in very ill health and I'm convinced that Oya prolonged his life. Um, her devotion, her care of him, she, was a, she is still alive and she's a remarkable woman. So these are just some of the reasons why I wrote this book. Um, and now I'd like to read you an excerpt from it. By the way, um, how many of you in the room have seen the movie The Third Man. Ah, <laughs> good. Well, this is probably um, my father's most famous movie role as an actor was the role that he played in The Third Man. And the excerpt I'm going to read is during one of my visits with my father when I was a teenager, at the time I was living in Johannesburg, South Africa with my mother and her third husband. And it took a long time for movies to get down to South Africa. So although The Third Man had been released for a while, I hadn't seen it yet. And I was visiting my father on one of my school vacations. And he was horrified when he heard I hadn't seen The Third Man. So he arranged for a private screening, which was thrilling for me, at Shepperton Studios outside of London. So that's the part of the book I'd like to share with you. Of course, I need my glasses. From Rome, we flew to London, where we were to spend several weeks before I was due back at school in Johannesburg. I look back on those whirlwind weeks, as I do on all the times I spent with my father in Europe, as both the pinnacle of my life up to that point and the foundation of my life to come. In our often fleeting times together, Orson Welles did more to shape my character, values, and aspirations than my mother and stepfather could have accomplished in a lifetime. Wherever my father went in London in those days, he was instantly recognized as Harry Lyme, the character he had played in the British thriller The Third Man. 
The role had made him more famous than anything he had ever done, including Citizen Kane. When I told my father I had, I had not seen The Third Man, he immediately arranged for a private screening at Shepperton Studios. There we were in the darkened projection room, just the two of us, enveloped in cigar smoke and watching the credits roll. That's you, I cried, when the name of Orson Welles appeared on the screen. He put a finger to his lips, but I was irrepressible. What part do you play, Daddy? The villain. <laughs> but Daddy, I want you to be the hero. Villains are a lot more fun, Christopher. My father's close friend, Joseph Cotton, played Holly Martins, an American writer who goes to Vienna in search of his old school chum, Harry Lyme. The beautiful Italian, Alida Valli, played Harry Lyme's girlfriend. The film was directed by Sir Carol Reed from an original screenplay by the novelist Graham Greene. Why didn't you direct it, Daddy? Shh, I'll tell you later, darling girl. As the movie began, I leaned forward eagerly in my seat, but long moments passed and still my father had not appeared on the screen. Daddy, I whispered, why aren't you in the movie yet? Shh, my love, be patient. Almost an hour into the film, when I thought I could no longer bear the suspense, I watched as a cat rubbed itself against a pair of highly polished black shoes, a man's shoes. Who could be hiding in the darkened doorway? Suddenly a light flicked on in an upstairs window, catching a man in its beam for an instant, slim, smiling, sardonic, devilishly handsome. It was the third man of the title, who had faked his own death to escape from the law and continue his life of crime. It was Harry Lyme, an American black marketeer in post-war Vienna, who spelled who spread illness and death by selling, by selling inferior penicillin. But was it also my father? For once he was not wearing a false nose or anything else that disguised his looks, and yet he was nothing like his real self. He had turned into the heartless, unscrupulous, wickedly charming Harry Lyme. I was so fascinated by the transformation that I paid scant attention to the story or the hypnotic zither music in the background. I was mainly impressed by Harry Lyme's long-awaited first appearance in the doorway and the heart-stopping chase through the gritty sewers of Vienna that ends in his capture. In the final scene, the wounded Lyme hauls himself up the sewer's iron staircase. He struggles to remove the manhole cover, but does not have the strength. In a last attempt at salvation, his fingers reach imploringly through the grating. It made me think of the damned souls in Michelangelo's hell reaching towards heaven. Well, what did you think? My father asked as the lights came up in the screening room. I told him I'd found the movie very exciting, especially the chase through the sewers. But what did you think of Harry Lyme? I know he was bad and deserved to be caught, but I still felt sorry for him at the end. You did? He broke into a broad grin. You mean you couldn't help liking him in spite of the terrible things he'd done? I nodded vigorously. Well, that's wonderful, Christopher. That's what makes this movie work, and any other one for that matter, that you can feel sympathy for the villain. From the way he was chomping his cigar, I could tell he was pleased with me. What about you, Daddy? I asked as we left the screening room. Do you like Harry Lyme? Like him? I hate him! <laughs> he spoke with a vehemence that startled me. He's utterly cold and without passion. Well, whatever we say about my father, he certainly was a man of passion. <laughs> So I wonder if, um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask me. I'd be very happy to uh, satisfy your curiosity. Yes? Excuse me, did you say how old you were when you were watching The Third Man? I was about 13 at that time. You missed it, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I actually, I do, it's sort of, 
I didn't say it because it's apparent in the narrative that that's the age that I was. Yes? Uh, not, not to detract from any of his major contributions, Yes. but I was always very impressed with his authorship of a book uh, when he was about 18 or so years of age and on William Shakespeare. And I was wondering if you have anything to say how at such an early age he came about to make such a communication in such depth. Well, you must be referring to the uh, playbooks that he did with Roger Hill when he was still a student at Todd. Um, he, he and Roger Hill got this idea of, make, of, of adapting Shakespeare's plays so that they could be performed by high school students. And my father wrote this incredible introduction to the book. I think that must be what you're referring to at a very early age, you're right. And, and he also illustrated the playbooks with absolutely charming drawings and cartoons of, of how he would stage the plays and how he would produce them in a, you know, in a setting, in a high school setting where you would have limited uh, props and so on, but he came up with ingenious ways for how you could stage it. And my father was interested in Shakespeare. Um, in that way, he, I think he was a prodigy because he was interested in Shakespeare when he was very young. And when he got to Todd School for Boys, he was only about 11 years old at the time. And all he wanted to do was cut classes and put on plays. That was his passion. And um, Skipper, as we called Roger Hill, he realized that he had a young genius on his hands. And so he allowed him to produce all these, these Shakespeare plays, which he did. And then, of course, my father, being a great one to promote himself, even at that early age, um, he then also took over the Todd School newspaper and he would review himself, you know, <laughs> give himself glowing reviews, you know, of, of, his, of his stage production. So, so all of that began at a very early age. Just a follow-up. Yes. You mentioned yeah. a couple who, uh, I'm not sure that how to technically express it, but who adopted him after his parents passed away? Well, they didn't legally adopt him, but they became, uh, they didn't legally adopt him, but they really became like his substitute parents. They were very close to him and very supportive of him. Oh, I was just wondering if yes. they had any yeah. influence on his development with regard to his first authorship, you know, his interest in William Shakespeare. Well, I think they, they helped him. They, they sort of provided the, the greenhouse in which he could blossom, grow and blossom. But actually, his interest in Shakespeare, as I said, began when he was even younger and before he came to Todd School because his mother, um, his mother used to read poetry to him when he was a little tiny baby. And, um, and she actually instilled in him from an early age, a love of literature and poetry and all those things. So I think she was very much the one who introduced him. Yes. Who, who, who else would like to know something? Yes. I remember a, a, a newsreel where he was being interviewed and he made a, a very much as I remember, a tongue-in-cheek apology for uh, upsetting everyone with the Martian Well, that's interesting what you raise because it's true that you're referring to the War of the Worlds broadcast, which was, was based on an H.G. Wells story, The War of the Worlds, and it was part of the Mercury Theater on the air. My father founded this theater company called the Mercury Theater, but it also was uh, on the radio because at that time, as you know, there was no television, so imagine a world without television. What would what, would the, what did the kids do? They all clustered around the radio, which was the size of a small refrigerator in those days, and listened to these, um, these radio dramas. Um, and the Mercury Theater of the air, on the air 
broadcasted, uh, broadcast every week a radio drama. And one of them was this very realistic um, interpretation of the War of the Worlds because my father read the story and he didn't think it was that exciting. He wanted to make it more exciting. He didn't realize just how exciting he was going to make it. So he thought, well, you know, I'll make it sound like they really are landing in New Jersey, in Grover Mill, New Jersey, and I'll get an actor to impersonate the president and another one to sound like the governor, and it'll all sound like it's really happening. But of course, everybody will know it's a story, that this is just a dramatization of a story. Well, of course, what happened, as some of you may know, is that in those days, people used to twiddle the dial. They would start listening to one program, and then they would go and listen to another program. So nobody, a lot of the country did not hear the opening statement, which is, this is a fictional drama. So they just tuned in in the middle of the program, and they heard what they thought was the president announcing that Martians had landed in New Jersey. You know, and, this, and this created a national panic, which it's very hard for us today to understand why people panicked to the degree that they did, because we've lost touch with how important radio was at that time and that all information was coming through the radio then. So people took radio very seriously. And we were also at a time in our history when we were about to enter World War II and so the country was very much on edge and, you know, it's hard to, now when you hear a recording of the War of the Worlds, you cannot imagine why people were jumping out of windows and piling everything into the car and heading for the hills, you know, because we, we don't understand it. But at the time, it, it was huge. Now, the thing is that my father really never intended to cause this ma national panic. And he was genuinely sorry about it. He really was. Um, he had intended it as a Halloween prank, and he couldn't believe that people, that, that intelligent people would honestly believe Martians had landed in New Jersey. He didn't think people could possibly believe this. He was just dumbfounded. But at the same time, he wasn't sorry that he became internationally famous overnight. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Father lost his parents when he was very young. Yes. Was there any theater in his background at all? You know, going back, his, his not that we not that we know him. What's interesting is that his mother, who I really believe in many ways was his muse, you know, um, his mother was a very gifted uh, woman, a pianist. She composed her own music, and she she had a kind of performance where she would play the piano, she'd play her own music, and at the same time she would recite poetry. And this became quite popular in her day. I mean, she performed in Chicago and in the Midwest, and then, and then because she died so young, she died of jaundice at, at, in an age when there was no cure for jaundice, um, she was carried off by illness when she was only, I think, 47 years old, which today seems horribly young. Um, but in any case, while she was alive, you know, for the first five, nine years of my father's life, he was very much under his mother's influence. And as I said earlier, she introduced him to poetry, to literature. Um, she encouraged him to memorize poetry when he was a child. And the other thing that she did was that she held these, uh, these musical evenings because she herself was a musician and she knew all the musicians in Chicago, so she would have all these people coming to the house, you know, sort of once a week they would all arrive, musicians and artists and writers. And so my father, as a young child, he was allowed to stay up with the grown-ups, but only as long as he was entertaining. The moment he became boring, he was sent to his room, sent off to his room. So I think this early experience encouraged my father to become an entertainer, you know, and um, and he and he remained one all his life. He he was the great teller of tales and uh, had a, always had a vast repertoire of stories to tell you and amuse you with, and you know, and it started in childhood. But as far as I know, there was no direct uh, theatrical background. Yes. 
Yeah. I'm a little bit struck, and I know it's, it's very dangerous to read too much into uh, translating what an individual's personal life is to his artistic uh, endeavors, but I can't help but be a little bit struck with his most famous creation, I guess, Citizen Kane. The character in that also loses his parents at a very young age and leaves him sort of adrift, and he becomes a very precocious prodigy that has to be living with adults all of this time. Do you, do you have any sense that there was some of your father's personal life in that narrative? Well, I think that's very perceptive, you, uh, perceptive of you because, yes, it's true that when they were doing the script for Citizen Kane, when Herman Mankiewicz was working on the script, they started out with this idea of doing an American tycoon, uh, but then in order to personalize him, uh, they decided to t take some biogra uh, autobiographical elements from my father's life and incorporate it into the character. So that did happen. Um, but but Cain, I mean, the, uh, the whole idea of Cain, as you probably know, was, uh, which is a theme in many of my father's films, but certainly in Cain, is the idea that money and power corrupt. I mean, this was one of his beliefs that um, too much money, too much power, and you become a monster, which is what happens to Cain. And then, of course, he repeated that theme in, in other, uh, in, in later films that he did. Um, yes, anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Do you have an opinion on what the significance of Rosebud was? <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I just take it as it was literally shown in the film. You remember in the last scene, uh, you see the sled burning, and you see the w word rosebud written on the sled. And I always felt that this meant that at the very end of his life, the character of Charles Foster Kane is remembering that joyous moment in his youth when he was careening down the snowbank on his sled and he was still an innocent child and he didn't know, I mean, in the movie it's brilliantly done because you see the child through the window coming down the hill on his sled and inside the room you see the adults in this sort of gloomy interior, you see the adults discussing his future and they're about to take him away from his parents and turn him over to his guardian where, and so that he no longer has a happy childhood. And I always thought that's what Rosebud meant, that it's just uh, on the moment of dying, he thinks of this glorious moment when he was still a happy, innocent child. Yes? Um, yeah. Obviously, you were born after your father became famous and those for the world solicitation before it even done. Um, how no, that's not true, actually. <laughs> oh, you look great. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> no, I, actually, I was six months old, I think. You don't have to tell us. <laughs> yeah, I think something like that. When, um, when War of the Worlds was broadcast. And, and <laughs> but, um, yeah, I wish I'd been older so I could have actually heard it. But anyway, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering. I haven't read your book yet, and I probably to get it today and start it this evening. Good. Um, what, how long did you actually live with him, you know, before yeah. your parents were divorced, and what do you remember of that time, you know, living with him on a day-to-day right. -day basis? Well, my parents were actually divorced when I was still a toddler, oh, okay. uh, but because we were all living in Hollywood at that time, and my mother's second husband was a great friend of my father's. He was Charlie Lederer. He was a um, he was a screenwriter in Hollywood who was known for his screwball comedies. Um, you may have all seen the movie My Gal Friday with Rosalind Russell, and well, that's typical of his humor. You know that. Was, he, so he was a very successful screenwriter and a good friend of my father's, and we all lived close to one another. So. While I was growing up in Hollywood, my father was in and out of our house all the time. Um. So, um, so I saw a lot of him uh, during the years when we lived there. And then, um, which, I, which I describe in the book that I hope you're going to buy tonight, 
and um, and then you know I saw then he went to Europe and then I ended up for a while in South Africa uh, but then my mother would arrange visits with him while I was a schoolgirl. I would spend a lot of time with him on my school vacations. But then, as Barbara said in her introduction, you know, sometimes years and continents would separate us. Um, so that was the sad part of my life, that I didn't see as much of my father as I would have liked to have seen. But the times that we did have together were so special. Yes. Were there uh, any directors or actors that uh, your father uh, admired? Well, he, he, when he first went to Hollywood, uh, and he didn't know about making movies at that point, he holed up in a projection room with John Ford's movie Stagecoach, mm -hmm. and he watched it over and over and over. And in a way, John Ford was like his teacher because he learned a lot of movie technique from watching that film. And then later on in his life, he admired tremendously the French director Jean Renoir. Um, and those are the two that come to mind. Yes, yeah. Uh, my question is two part. Could you tell us a little bit about your life now and also perhaps some of the values your father instilled in you? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> Um, I love to talk about the values my father instilled in me because he really was such an inspiration to me in many ways. But first, I mean, I just live very quietly in Greenwich Village with my husband. I'm a writer and I can't wait for all this book promotion to end so I can go back into my writing room and close the door and think about what I'm going to write next. So my life revolves around my husband and my writing and my family and my friends. Not, not much to talk about really. Um, but in terms of the values that my father instilled in me, um, I'm so glad you asked this because, as I said earlier, I ho hope my book will give a much fuller and more accurate picture of my father than exists in the, in the books about him. And one thing I want people to know about him is that he was a man of great principle who fought for the causes that he believed in. Most people don't realize how political he was and how he championed, particularly in the 40s, he championed African-American culture. He played jazz on his radio program at a time when nobody was listening to jazz, but he believed that it was one of the great contributions that America had to make to world culture. And he also staged um, Richard Wright's novel, Native Son, on Broadway. And even earlier in his career, he, he did a production of Macbeth in Harlem with an all-black cast, which had never been done before. And, but beyond just what he did to try to promote African-American writers and actors and culture in general, he also um, he championed the cause of an African-American soldier who was honorably discharged during World War II, returned home to the South, and was brutally beaten by a local sheriff, beaten so badly that he was actually blinded. And his crime was getting off a bus and using the restroom, which apparently was reserved for whites only. Well, my father, when my father heard this, he was so horrified. And at that time, you have to remember, he was one of the biggest personalities in radio then. And he had his own radio show. And he started issuing weekly appeals on his show to bring the sheriff to justice. Um, well, at the time, CBS wasn't too happy about this. Because we have to remember, this was in the 1940s. America was still, the South was still segregated. You know, this was way back when people weren't that happy with what my father was saying on the radio. And so they came to him and they said, Orson, if you keep this up, we're going to have to kill your show. Well, he kept it up. And eventually, the sheriff was caught 
and he was brought to trial. And I'm sorry to say that because this was in the South, he was acquitted. But what I like about this story is that my father really put his principles ahead of his popularity on the radio. And these are the kinds of things that I want better known about him. Yes, man in the blue shirt. Um, I wanted to hear you talk about some of his films, if you would, um, and talk to us about some of the, the what your favorite of his films are and what you remember him saying about his films, the ones that he liked or what he liked or didn't want to say. Well, it might surprise you to know that my favorite films of my father's were made in Europe um, and they're not screened in this country as often as I wish they would be. And at the top of the list is a film called Chimes at Midnight. I don't know how many people have seen that in this room. Um, but my father considered it his masterpiece. He once said to me, if I had to get into heaven on the basis of one movie, Chimes is the one I would offer up because he felt that he came the closest to achieving his directorial vision in that movie. Um, I think his feeling about his American movies was that since almost, with the exception of Citizen Kane, Citizen Kane is unique because he retained artistic control of that movie from beginning to end. But unfortunately, that never happened again during his years in Hollywood. Every single movie that he made in Hollywood was taken out of his hands. He did not have the final cut. He did not have the final say. Um, Magnificent Ambersons, from his point of view, was butchered because they changed the ending they hacked it to pieces. Um, he, he never even wanted to watch it. It was so upsetting to him to see what they had done to his movie. And the same thing happened with Touch of Evil, um, Lady from Shanghai. I mean, there wasn't a single movie he made in this country that he was allowed, where they didn't take it away from him, because, I, I think, because Hollywood didn't understand what he was trying to do. You know. Hollywood was not in the business of making art movies. They were in the business of entertainment. And when they saw that his films were not going to be box office successes, well, they took it away and tried to add music, add close-ups, uh, you know, uh, change the ending, make it a happy ending. You know, they were constantly monkeying around with it to try to make it more popular. So, um, yes. Yes, yeah. about the Magnificent Anderson. Right. Robert Osborne told me that I believe in the late 60s your father tried to reshoot the ending because the actors were still alive and they aged the correct number of age, uh, years for their characters. I thought you could shed any light on that. You know, I don't know. I, I wish I could, but I, I, don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that he never managed to pull it off. Yes. I just wondering if you ever got a chance to know any of the members of the Mercury Theater Company, and if so, do you have a favorite or a, an anecdote? Well, one of the members of the Mercury Theater, who actually became my godfather, even though I was never baptized, so that was quite a feat. <laughs> but um, he was, um, his name, well, we called him Chubby, but his real name was Hiram Sherman, and he was very dear to me, um, and he was... He was a comic actor, and um, he became a big star in, um, I'm just going blank right now, I'm trying to think what production it was, because of course I never saw, I hadn't been born yet, so I didn't see any of these plays, but I think it was, oh I know, it was called The Shoemaker's Holiday. It was a restoration comedy that my father put on, and Chubby played the sort of fool in it, and it made him a Broadway star overnight. Um, but he left the Mercury Theater because he just, he, he couldn't take the pace, you know, the all-night rehearsals and the, it, it was just more than he could handle. So he was only with the Mercury for the first season, and then he left. Yes? 
What is the title again of the movie he was most proud of? Chimes at Midnight. Thank you. Yeah. What were you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the best things about being a Wells fan is that because there's so many unfinished projects, it always feels like there's constantly movies about to come out. <laughs> and I was wondering what your reactions were to, especially a movie like uh, Other Side of the Wind. Yes. Constantly trying to find new bits of information on the release of it. Right. But also, if you were involved with the efforts of uh, your your, uh, your half sister Beatrice Wells or Peter Bogdanovich or any of those to get these movies out there to the public. Well, I know that the other side of the wind has been a saga that has been going on for years and years and years. And as you may know, Oya Kodar, my father's companion, she holds the rights to it because um, when my father died, he left he left all his unfinished projects to Oya because she had been she had worked by his side for the last twenty years of his life, and and he felt she would be the one who would best understand how, you know, what to do with these un incomplete works. Oya tried very, very hard after my father's death, she tried very hard to find a producer who would provide funding to complete The Other Side of the Wind, and nobody really wanted to put up the money for it. Um, and also, it's just so hard to know, I mean, I have seen fragments of it at Orson Welles retrospectives. I don't know if you've ever seen scenes from it. They're occasionally shown. But it's very hard to know from these fragments what the f total film would be and what, and, wh and, and, and what he would have done with it because my father really made, crafted the film in the editing room. So what, we're just seeing rushes, you know. We, we don't know what, how he would have cut the film what he would have made of it. It's hard to know how, if anyone else could come closest to his vision. Now, Peter Bogdanovich has been saying for years that Orson told me that I should be the one to finish the film. But the problem is, nobody heard Orson telling you. <laughs> so we, we only can go, well, Peter's word for it, you know. So I don't know. I, it, it's, from what I've heard, it just sounds like a boondoggle. I, I don't know if it'll ever be finished, or if we'll ever see more than the fragments that are shown at uh, Orson Welles' retrospectives. Yes? I yeah. to ask a question. Yeah. So, sort of the narrative, like you were mentioning other books about Orson Welles, and sort of the right. narrative is he had all these incredible achievements, and then in the last years of his life, or you know, post whatever the 1960s, that somehow we have this impression that he wasn't artistically fulfilled, or he was just doing wine commercials or uh, appearing at Dean Martin or something like that, which wasn't bad either, but, but you know, that he wasn't really fulfilled artistically. Is, uh, can you speak to that at all? Or? Yes, I, I would like to speak to that because one of the things that really upsets me is the image of my father, which, which only exists in this country, that uh, this, this phrase that keeps cropping up, uh, the failed genius, or, you know, Orson Welles uh, showed such early promise, and then after Citizen Kane, it was all downhill. You know, this perception of him that uh, he was a genius, but then one morning he woke up, and by golly, he wasn't a genius anymore, you know? He, um, and so somehow that's something that could disappear. You know, either you are or you're not. But it, if you are, then you are until the end of your days. And I think part of this perception is the result of ignorance of the work that my father did in Europe. Because as I mentioned earlier, he made six movies in Europe. Almost none of them are ever shown in this country. He also did a lot of other work. He did stage work. Uh, radio work, uh, again, in Europe, but, but not in this country. Now, it's very interesting that he is revered in Europe, that he is high, greatly admired. Um, in 2005, at the International Film Festival in Locarno, Switzerland, there was a, a special homage to my father that went on for 15 days. I mean, it took 15 days to see all his work. Uh, and only a small portion of this is known to the American public. So I think that's created this idea that, 
oh, he was, he did all these great things in his 20s, and now here, here he is selling no wine before it's time and doing magic tricks on Dick Cabot show because most people don't know what he was doing in, in between. When he came back to the United States in the early 1970s, he came back with the hope, because he was quite happy living in Europe, he didn't really want to come back to the United States, but he was persuaded by friends of his that he could work in television. And suddenly he said, wow, the television, this is a new canvas for my art. Um, well, he made some pilots, television pilots, but they were so avant-garde that the TV people just didn't know what to make of them. I mean, he was always decades ahead of himself. So he came back with the idea that he was going to get into television, and then that didn't work out. And then, literally, to pay his rent, he had to do voiceovers, uh, commercials, narrate other people's documentaries, because nobody, you know, Hollywood was very happy to give him awards, but they didn't want to give him any money to make a picture because they figured he was bad news. We mustn't let him near a picture because it'll be a big flop and we'll lose money. And, and this was the reputation that he had in Hollywood, which he could never live down, which is really sad in a way, because he came back and he still, you know, when he got the, when he was given the Lifetime Achievement Award, I remember calling him up and congratulating me, him, and, and, and he said, no, no, it's much too soon. I, they, they give you the Lifetime Achievement Award at the end of your career. I, 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 still, ha I still have movies I want to make. He was almost distressed that they had given him this award, like he's, you know, ready to be put in his coffin, when in fact he, he wanted, he still felt he could keep on working for years. Yes. Time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Yeah. In all his travels, did he have a favorite place to live or visit? Oh, he had many. Uh, he spent many, many happy uh, times in Croatia, which was where Oya, Oya was Croatian, and they lived in Split, uh, a beautiful part of the world, the Dalmatian coast. She had a house there. Um, he loved Spain. He had a special feeling for Spain. Yes? How did he regard his acting career? Not his directing, but his acting career. Did he have a favorite role, acting role? He had a hate-love relationship with acting because he always maintained that he hated acting. I never believed this because he was so good. But he said, oh, he hated it. He only did it because he had to, and that he mainly did it to make money because, you know, we have to remember that he was the first independent filmmaker who was financing his own pictures, and the main reason he was doing this was to make money. But I do want to tell one little story. Um, do I have time? Yeah. Or do, do, do we have, have time? Do I have time? Okay. And then we'll end with that? Okay. okay. Unless there's somebody who's got a burning question that I can answer. <laughs> um, somebody I haven't heard from, the man in the blue shirt. Yes. I was just curious yeah. whether um, his relationship with Rita Hayworth and whether you met her and whether, whether your opinions of her were. Well, I did know Rita as a child. Um, and some of my happiest childhood memories are connected with Rita, who was an absolute delight. And in fact, I write about her in the first chapter of my book, so if you buy my book, you'll know all about it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, after a citizen came, uh, how I've uh, heard and read that William Randolph Hearst had a very uh, a negative effect on Orson Welles' career. And I'd just like to know uh, if you would speak to that. Well, definitely he did, because William Randolph Hearst, can you imagine, he tried to destroy the negative of Citizen Kane. I mean, can you imagine if he'd succeeded and we had lost Citizen Kane, which many people still believe is the greatest movie ever made. I mean, what a loss that would have been. You know, he, was, uh, he did everything to suppress Citizen Kane and to ruin my father's career, to paint him as a communist and a red, and to have him hauled up before the, um, 
in, you know, what was it called? The car, yeah. So he did everything he could to, to ruin my father. But, I, but he didn't fully succeed. He partly, partly succeeded, but not fully. But in any case, I, I know we're almost done, so I, I would just like to end this with an example of my father's wonderful sense of humor. Um, when I was a toddler, uh, my parents were having a trial separation, and my mother went to Ireland where she stayed with her friend, the actress Geraldine Fitzgerald, and I went with my nanny to live with my father in Brentwood. And it just so happened, he'd rented this house in Brentwood, it just so happened that we were living next to Shirley Temple, the great child star, and her mother. So one afternoon, I was toddling around on the lawn, and Shirley Temple's mother and Shirley came over to visit. And Shirley Temple's mother asked my father, Orson, when are you going to put Christopher in pictures? And he said, I'm going to wait until she's two years old because I want her to have a normal childhood. <laughs>